there. So we'll change the output here. So we should have that. So we write our flow objects for our outputs. Um, what we're going to do is, if this is an output, do we actually know if it's an output? We have box, input weight, we have direction, we have type. All right. And we're setting the magnitude to the object weight. So we'll have float weight, and we're going to set that to um, object.in weight and we're going to say if um, object.in type equals e water flow object type uh, wfo output then weight equals object let's do the maximum here weight equals fmath max of object.in Eat and object .m input weight, or is it max input weight? There's too much crap in all this code. There's just too much all in one spot. It's gotten just too big. All right, it is input weight. And then we need to use this here and here. All right, so this should make it so our half calculations override our weights. Yeah, you got those rubber wheels, right? Don't think you need insurance when nobody is driving. Well, I think, I think that's not true in some ways, if I remember. Like I know I had my car. Yeah, it's like I think you need I think you need insurance at all times. The company would argue acts of God are not covered. Lightning is not an act of God, it's an act of nature. Is is rain an act of God? Science. Yeah, why else do you have insurance? <laughs> why else do you have insurance if not to cover random shit that happens? And I think the reason I know that insurance is necessary for when you're not driving your vehicle is because I always have lived within walking distance from work. So what will end up happening is I just won't use my car for just years. And um, it would just sit there, and I'd be like, do I really need insurance on that thing? Because I don't use it. Like, I used my car so little when I was in California that, like, the battery just died because I hadn't driven the car in, like, six months. Because I didn't need to. All right, so we got our inputs and our outputs. Those are getting set, so that's awesome. Now let's uh, let's do our blurs. Yeah, 
And it's one of those things, like, if the, I think if the car isn't in storage, it needs, like, actual insurance for you driving because, you know, you, you could argue, well, oh, you know, it's just sitting in the parking spot. I don't actually drive the car. The well, same thing with, like, you need to have it insured or um, registered and everything, with current registration, even if you don't use your car. You, know, you, you need new tabs and all that crap if your state does tabs. All right, let's see. I need to add the next step. The next step is this tiered average and the rest. So let's take a look at the tiered average, and then we'll look at the blurs, and then we'll look at the other blurs. And then our flow field, I think, will be done. Yeah, I think the only way that you can have an uninsured car or something like that is if you specifically set aside like a $60,000 like lump sum of money in your bank or something to cover liability. Because you at least need to be able to pay for medical expenses if you plow into somebody on accident or into somebody's car or somebody's house or into the guardrail and out into some lake. Uh, that was one of the funniest things. Um, when I was working at EA, I would walk to work um, kind of through this wetlands area. And it was like through Oracle and a bunch of apartment complexes that were just kind of situated there. And one of these apartment complexes had like a T-junction. Um, so kind of how it worked was, you know, there's like a road like this. And then there's like, you know, here are houses or apartments, like a big apartment complex. And then so there's like this big, like, you know, water area over here. And, you know, there's like all these bushes and stuff along here. And just one, one morning walking to work, there's just, you know, there's bushes and then not bushes. <laughs> <laughs> just two big tire tracks right into the damn water. <laughs> just the bush is all screwed up and just just like man, somebody just went <clears throat> straight through all this crap when they were driving home or something. And you're just like shit. <laughs> you know, kind of like a a a picture Tells the story of a thousand words. Just a very simple still image there of somebody. Yeah, somebody had a fun night that, that turned into a very unpleasant night very quickly. All right, so we've got our. What, is this the tiered average or whatever the hell of all this? So. It looks like it's a little bit too... It's too fast. We need to... We need to write the zeros out, I think, for this tiered average. For the magnitude. All right, well, I'm going to be right back, and we'll continue on this.
Yeah, we're getting a lot closer. And, well, the thing is those magnitudes should be closer to black than they should be, because th that water should be still. Though I guess that's a, a question. But I kind of want the water to bias towards having channels of fast-moving water. Rather than... Have everywhere have fast-moving water. Alright, so we're calculating our averages. We need this like right pixel. It's not necessarily that we need all this. It's it might not be the writing of the pixel. That's screwing this up. It might be the weighted tier. Um, so we have the tiered averages. And we've written them to our pixels. We post-process all the values. And then we call get info. Let me try this. Why don't we have the level bias towards the smaller levels um, for the magnitudes and um, but not do the same thing for the directions. See how that looks. So magnitudes should use local magnitudes much more, which should have like the random vector directions stuff in there, the random particles will fill it out. I'll see how that looks. Because the random particles are only going to have a weight of one, which is like the random motion in the water for the lake. Because I'm not sure, I mean, we pretty much want a steady state sort of thing. So we'll tick this thing, generate, we'll see what it looks like. And all these dark pixels are the random pixels. They just look, they look like black because everything else is white. So yeah, you can see the, um, the tiered average stuff is looking better. There's less data over here, probably, what's going on, so it gets influenced a little bit. Well, let's see what the... Yeah, that's, that's not bad, actually. So let's see what the blur does to it. All right, so we'll have the fine pass blur. Take, take a look at what that looks like, and then we'll have the general blur. And if that does it, then we'll be done with our flow field, pretty much. Um, well, we'll be done, and then what we should do is mess around, move rocks around, add some more inputs, and see what actually happens to our water.
and then maybe I can actually work on something that looks like water instead of something that looks like a whole bunch of garbage. But we're going to have to clean up code and do other crap before that, so... One step at a time. A whole bunch of particles, yes. So that's the fine blur. Yeah, I'm not sure I like how these values are all white over here. They should be black. Um, basically, we want to set in here. We have a direction. Our direction needs to be here, but our magnitude needs to be a zero if, um, If we are sure, like the direction is different, um, we need the we need a thing in here to actually check if we are sure and then write to it. All right, this is on the calculated flow field, so we need the sure field. Sure data. Where are you? Let's see the distance data. So we'll snag the index here. It's the R value.
Why would having more data I mean we should have its average data? So why would having more data do anything? I don't know. I'll have to figure it out. Let's see how this goes. Because I was seeing this get washed out, which we don't want. We at least don't want it that washed out. It should be washed out a bit, but eh, you know, like. Yeah, that's more of what we should be seeing, is that sort of that sort of thing. All right, all right, that's starting to look okay. I don't like how this is. How this is fast over here. Like that's it should be like this. Why would this area be quick? Has to do with the tiered average. Okay, so we're writing our tiered average and we're post-processing and then we blur. Well, no, we don't blur. We have the mag times the tiered magnitude, which is going to be getting the info from here. Why don't we just have it be exponential? So we will we'll have exponential level. We will be much, much, much more inclined to take the more specific values for the magnitude to fill in all the blank pixels. It may also be that we don't want to take any level except for the highest, the most specific level that has information for the info. And let's turn the blur off as well for right now while I fix this. So we're filling in all the empty spaces with a best guess average. And right now that best guess average is taking too much of the global movement of the water. And we want to bias it much more towards the local stuff. And the question is like, well, do we even care about global movement for the magnitude? Uh, the global movement for the, for the direction stuff seemed to work really well.
This also is going to bias it much more towards a grid square shape, which is okay. So we'll tick all these particles. We'll see what it looks like now. Yeah, why, why, why is this over here like that? Why do we even have the white area? Doesn't really make sense because of this one white pixel? Or are we indexing wrong somewhere? Like, that makes no sense to me. We must be. You must be doing something that's odd. Like the, these white pixels must be doing... Must be indexing off into some faraway land. Maybe we should have a completely different algorithm for clearing out the magnitude stuff. Maybe we should just do an, a, a reverse blur. Like for every pixel that's a zero, we just look around ourselves, grab everything that we find in a certain radius, and just fill it in if we find anything. Let's do that. Let's just... write in something completely different for this. So we'll just go through everything. Um, since we're already iterating, should we just go ahead and check it out here? Nah, I kind of want to do it after we've got everything written here and zeroed and all that crap. We'll just go through all over again. Because we can. And we're going to have like a blur radius here. Radius. All right, so we're gonna do for basically doing this inner X, inner Y crap. Alright, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say float mag yeah, pix dot mag equals so if pix dot mag no it's something else. It's not mag, it's um I guess if this equals zero and cache distances yeah, okay, we'll, we'll early out. Yeah, so like if cache distances of index is less than equal to zero, then continue. Otherwise, yeah. Or picks. Or picks.mag is greater than zero. 
Otherwise, we need our int32, which will be our like number. So discovered values. So, so if pix dot mag is greater than zero, or pix dot m particle, or pix, what do we got for these? Path. Pix dot object then um, we're gonna do our pix.mag plus equals pix.mag and the num plus plus All right, so we're going to need the cache distances sub inner index it is less than or equal to zero. Then we continue there. It needs to be inner index. All right, so after we do all this, we do if num is greater than zero, uh, pix.mag divide equal by num. Okay, so instead of doing a tiered magnitude search, what we're going to do is we're going to, for every empty pixel, we're going to average all the pixels around it to fill it in with a radius. And that radius is 16. Let's see what it looks like. This should be dot r. This is just so much just garbage. Just air it over this. Do this. This math. Do this math. Do this. God. Be like explaining exactly how this thing works. Be like, well, we just kind of. I was trying to explain some of this to like my dad while we were fishing, and I was like, well, it's basically like you have a jack in the box, and you just keep turning this crank, and then eventually you have like water that flows down the hill. And he's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I'm just like. Uh, the jack-in-the-box being the um, ticking the particle system and stuff like that. <laughs> Alright, so we'll get our particles simulated. And we'll see how this like inverse blur works. I mean that's that's not bad. That's filled in pretty much everything that we want. 
Um, it might be a little too strong though. And then when we blur this out, it'll work. Like we've got our directions in here, so stuff would move real slow. Oh yeah, we need our... I need to skip all these particles here. Yeah, it's getting closer. It's definitely getting closer to what we want, want it to look like. It's actually one of the things that I think it has really improved my communication skills as an engineer is to explain te technical concepts to non-technical people. Um, you end up having to use a lot of analogies that they can understand and that really helps it when you're trying to talk to somebody who is also technically inclined like another engineer and maybe you're not getting everything across succinctly. So you'd be like, well, this is, you know, like, let's say you have a factory and this is a factory that makes cars, and like this other one is a factory that makes other factories. And you're like, oh, okay, so it's like a meta concept. I don't know. I, I, I found that has really helped out. Because then you actually have to be creative in what you're thinking about. You're like, ah, shit, I gotta relate this. You know, like, I have to relate memory management to somebody who only knows how to swing a hammer or something like that and you're like well uh, memory is like a toolbox and you gotta put tools in there and you know like if, if you put some tools in there kind of all fucked up like eventually you can't put anything in there so you gotta put tools in like organized rows and then you can find them better but organized rows aren't always the most efficient for you know finding things and and, you know, like, a linked list is, like, if you had a whole bunch of tools that were strung together on a rope, and maybe, a, like, around your, your waist. Alright, this is looking incorrect. Because we didn't do anything. All right, so picks.path. Is it correct? As this goes along, it's actually going to write to these particles. We need to only take these into account. Oh man, this is interesting. <laughs> Tool belt in the table. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff like that. I don't know. It's like, well, let's let's say you're trying to find, you know, the screwdriver. Do you like how do you find the screw screwdriver on your tool belt? Do you just start on the left and keep going around? Or do you have like some sort of search algorithm that involves maybe a weight which is you know, like like how heavy is this side of my tool belt and you kind of start there the shapes of handles yeah <laughs> like I was describing um, uh, pointers to my dad, I think, and I was saying things like, well, a pointer is like, you know, let's say you're trying to mail a letter to somebody, you know, you would just write their address on it and, um, and then put it in the mailbox and then, you know, that person would read the, ad you know, the mailman or whatever reads the address and knows which house to go to because of its address. And I was like, well, instead of writing the address, like, let's say instead of you know, you have this letter and you're trying to deliver it to somebody. Instead of writing their address, you physically put 
the universe onto the letter. You know, <laughs> like you physically put the universe, you know, a copy of a copy of their house onto the letter, and they'd be like, "Hey, deliver this to a house that looks exactly like this." You know, it's like, uh, you know that letter is going to that's that's going to be a little unwieldy and impractical. Alright, so we skipped over all the Pix particle objects and crap like that, um, and then we resulted in this, which is wrong. Like, how come the other one had values? Like, I would expect this to blur out. Like, this pixel wouldn't have anything that would grab stuff. This, this, there must be something wrong here. If this equals false, and this equals false, and this equals false, then continue. Well, we only have a few particles, um, so when we're going out, like a radius of 16 is not going to be too much. Visibility check would, would fail after memory was not found. Like, shit, I don't even remember what a screwdriver looks like. <laughs> Alright, so we have the inner index um, of this thing. We're going to check if the distance is zero, we'll continue. Otherwise... Let's just try this again and see if maybe I just screwed up fat fingered something. What even is a flathead screwdriver? That's true. Who the hell who the hell came up with the with the invention of the star drive screwdriver? Yeah. Somebody who thought differently. We could go through every particle and write to every particle that's close to it, or we could go to the shore and, you know, kind of do an inverse, you know, a true inversion. Let's just try this again. So let's see, we have ticked it, we'll generate and see what it looks like. I just, I just don't really like it. Maybe it's correct. Maybe this is what it's supposed to be, so I should stop just freaking out about it and just just be like, well this is what the this is what the weights are supposed to be. These things aren't moving that fast. So they shouldn't be moving that fast. Stop 
thinking anything else should be there. This, this is probably what it should be. Alright. So why don't I reduce that radius to 16, see what that looks like, and um, why don't we put we put our blurs on it and um, take a look. Right, we need to check here if <laughs> the cache distances are less than zero for this right. And we'll see how this looks. Yeah, loppers for both coaches. Trade names can get pretty ridiculous. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, one of the things I also try to do is try to come up with absolutely ridiculous analogies that still make sense. So that, that also was pretty funny. Like we'd be talking in meetings about technical terms and I'd come up with some analogy that compares a whole bunch of random crap. And then people are just like, man, <laughs> that was informative and also mildly entertaining. But you're still an asshole. And that's usually how those meetings went. Um, so. And meetings with me were usually pretty brutal. Like I remember this one meeting at Amazon where... This guy was showing off his chat system where he could have like two users chat with each other and how it would scale and use all, all sorts of different stuff. And like he stopped after like 10 minutes, you know, and, and he asked like, are there any questions so far? And I just like, you know, I raised my hand because I had a lot to say about it. And like that, that's a mistake. Like if you're running through a presentation and you have like an hour to do stuff and you're like are there any questions so far um you should immediately cut people off if, if they have any questions other than like basic stuff and, and i pretty much like then took 30 minutes of just like asking this dude questions over and over and over again and one of the funniest damn things about it was like it's a chat program so one of the one of the questions i was like well can you turn it off and, you know because <laughs> you know he's in the middle of a presentation and he was like, are there any questions? They're like, yeah, can you can you shut the fuck up now? <laughs> well, one of the things is with a chat program, like if the guy on the other side goes offline, how do you tell? You know, it, it can be difficult. Like, was it a disconnection or did the person actually walk off or, you know, how do messages get handled? It's kind of a legitimate question, but the people in the room, it sounded like um, I was just, you know, I, I just started asking all these technical questions and all this crap. But then, you know, I'm like, well, can you just turn it off? I thought it was funny. He thought it was not not very funny at all. Um, but he he pretty much just said uh, no. <laughs> so I, I think that was that was justified. All right, so we have stuff here. I think our blurs are kind of. Crapping up everything. Maybe they are. Maybe they aren't. Is it good enough? Is it good enough? Might be good enough. I think it might be good enough. I think that's our flow field. Chat system is fairly easy, actually hugely easy. 
Oh, I don't know, Chris Kyoku. You might be you might be surprised at how getting push messages properly set up across multiple devices with devices like phones having different mediums of chat. You know, you can't just open a TCP socket. All right, Chris Goku. Let's see if if chat is so easy, how would you build a chat server? Um, and and the correct answer is just boot up an XMPP server and use that. Um, but but how would you design a chat server then? <laughs> OSI model. Well, that's that's not really. You'll use the OSI model. <laughs> So you use the whole, you know, application presentation data link thing. That's that's not really that's not really all that goes into it, right? Like, you know, that's just kind of a model of how data is transferred from one thing to the other. This is more like how do you create chat rooms? You know, how do you have people with statuses that are all online in a way and know if people are actually online and then where do you store messages if you're going to deliver them um, when they're online next and all this other stuff you'll, you'll use booleans all right there you go we got our we got our chat system what we'll do is um, we'll create our chat system by um, you will get each person in this chat system will be delivered a quantum communication device which is actually a um, a needle which you shove you you put it on on your leg and every time somebody says something it just stabs you and um, that's how you'll communicate with each other you just you know stab is a one and not stab is a zero and you just kind of figure it out you just write it down as um, as you're going along You use TCP handshakes and don't don't use UDP. Oh man, if you could even do a TCP handshake on some of this hardware, you're, you're actually stretching it. All right, so that's our is that our flow field? Like I think it is. Like there it is, it's there. So what do we need to do? We need to clean up some of our information. All right, so we need to clean up. Going. Some sort of epidermal abrasion for <laughs> yeah. When the TCPs are falling, they're offline. Well, you know, sometimes you don't have TCP connections. Like having a direct TCP connection with somebody um, usually means that it won't work in a corporate environment, right? Like Facebook games and all that stuff use port 80 or, you know, 443 or whatever and don't use TCP classically because TCP direct connections will be blocked by your corporate IT infrastructure and only HTTP stuff, which actually has headers and everything else, will actually be able to go through. So, you know, how would you create a chat system that gets around those sorts of Johnny is still alive. John has bled out. <laughs> All right, so we want this blur radius thing. It's in our tiered average stuff. TCP is just a program. Well, it's just a communication strategy. I don't know. The main thing is you use HTTP with TCP style underneath. So you're basically saying WebSockets. Um, well, there's a lot of stuff there where you know your corporate infrastructure will kill connections. Things won't support WebSockets. Um, or if they do, support it all weird and stupid. And, you know, people are on shitty Wi-Fi connections that drop packets all the time and screw up messages and drop connections for no reason, reestablish them, 
and depending upon how people communicate with your backend servers, like if you have a load balancer and somebody comes back in to connect to a, a server behind a load balancer, like how does that work? And if that's a different server that that client gets connected to, how do you migrate any messages from the server they were communicating with to the server that they are now connected to? And there's all this other stuff um, which goes into it, which is it's interesting stuff. Um, so you think, you know, a simple, it, it's a simple question, really. Like, I just need to send a message to one other person. Um, you know, how do I do it? But then there's like, to actually get it to work in the real world is a very complex question. And 32, um, let's see. Magnitude fill radius is what we want to pass in here. I think we just use M magnitude fill radius. That would probably be a good one. So let's see, where do we set all this garbage? All right. Set flow field shit. Depends on server power company resources. <laughs> Yeah, there's, it's a, it's a really big, like, chat stuff is actually really difficult to do properly. Like, a lot of people have staked their, staked their claim that they can go do that and utterly failed for, like, massive chat room stuff. Like, even MMOs, right? Like, you know, you don't have global chat. You got, like, you know, you have instances of global chat and, like, all this other crap. Because of how bad the spam can be. <laughs> Might tell them impossible with the budget. Yeah, like we need we need chat. Like nah, I can't do it. Like what? Yeah, it was one of the things that um, I put together. Because one of the difficult questions is getting push messages. Like it's always a, the big, the big thing I've always made sure in any server architectures I've been working on is that I can actually use push messaging. I can actually address a message to something else, and um, no matter what I'm doing, so and get a response over this system. So I can. It's not just good enough that I can send a message. I need to be able to send a message and get a response, and I need to know if it gets delivered. And that can be very difficult to implement, especially when some people are using phones, some people are using computers, and some people are using Dixie, st Dixie Cups and String. It, it, it can be difficult to bridge those networks at times. But it's possible to do so. Uh, solving the actual chat.